Golden apples in silver dishes. An apple a day for 12 days. W.J. Hawking. Second edition, C.A. Hammond, 1945. As apples of gold in pictures, baskets, of silver. Is a word spoken in season, Proverbs 25 verse 11 New Translation. 7th to 12th day. 7th day. Fire for the chilled and food for the hungry. Part 1. When therefore they went out on the land, they see a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread, John 21 verse 9. God's care of us in the common things of life, though so constant, often comes to us in the nature of a surprise. Have we not at times said plaintively and anxiously, what shall we eat on the morrow? Then in the morning, drawing aside the tent curtains, we have seen at our very door little, round, eatable things, fallen from heaven? Day by day, our daily bread. While we were sleeping, angels, sent forth to minister to the heirs of salvation, had spread for us a table in the wilderness. How the sight of this choice provision by heavenly hands filled us with shame and self-reproach. We forgot that our Father knew our need of food, for both body and soul. Truly, our flesh is weak in faith, but our God is faithful. God enables the unable, too. Elijah displayed a mighty energy when he ran before the chariot of Ahab a cook from Carmel to Jezreel. But he so ran because he knew the secret place of strength. The praying man of God would not rise from his knees until the little black rain cloud appeared. Then he rose on wings as an eagle, after three years of famine, he ran and was not weary. But even the fine gold may become dim. And Jezebel's sharp tongue filled with fear the prophet who alone on Carmel had faced the four hundred priests of Baal. Fearing the wrath of the queen, he fled into the wilderness, and fell asleep under a juniper tree, praying in his hunger and despair that he might not awake. The prophet of God was cold and famished in a barren land. But a surprise was in store for Elijah at his waking. No ravens were there with a ration of bread and flesh. The touch which aroused him was not that of a widow woman with her bottomless meal tub and a few sticks for a fire. Elijah found his Bethel when he was under the juniper tree. He was not to die, but live. An angel of the Lord had provided for his wants. Fire and food, the gifts of his God, were at his elbow. At the prayer of Elijah, fire had fallen from heaven upon the sacrifice on Mount Carmel. Water had fallen upon the parched land from the windows of heaven, opened at the prayer of that same righteous man. But the burning coals, the hot cakes, and the crews of water were given him of God unasked. How faithful was and is our God! Jehovah knew the long and toilsome journey before his servant. The angel provided him a second meal after further sleep. In the strength of that food, not prepared by human hands, Elijah traveled for forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the Mount of God. As David sang, so also might Elijah have sung, It is God that girds me with strength, and makes my way perfect, Psalm 18 verse 32. Truly, our God ever prepares the way for us, as he also prepares us for the way. Wherefore should we doubt him? Though we may well distrust ourselves, not occasionally, but always. Let us come now to the Sea of Tiberias. After that, I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee, said the Lord to his disciples on the night of his betrayal. To the women at the empty sepulchre, the angel said, Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him, as he said to you, Mark 14 verse 28, Mark 16 verse 7. Accordingly, the disciples, knowing that their master was risen from the dead, went in due course into Galilee that they might see him. Thus far this was commendable obedience. But weak flesh is impatient of delay. It was too tedious for them to wait patiently for the Lord to appear and direct their steps, I go a fishing, says one. We come with thee, say the rest. Oh, ye followers of the risen Christ, think of the impetuous Saul, that disobedient king who refused to wait for Samuel to offer the burnt sacrifice, 1 Samuel 13 verses 8 to 14. His fleshly haste cost him his kingdom. 
sheep of Christ, will you not wait in patience for the great shepherd who was smitten for you? Do not spoil your obedience by your impatience. But the seven disciples, well aware of the Lord's promise to be in Galilee before they were, sailed away on their fishing adventure, though the Master had not yet disclosed himself to them. Was there no one of them who recalled those words in the Lord's farewell, without me, ye can do nothing? At any rate, they all proved their truth that night on the Sea of Tiberias. For all their strength, their skill, their sagacity, their seamanship, were unavailing, that night they caught nothing. And the early morning light found them a weary, dispirited, listless, hungry crew, overwhelmed with the shame of a fruitless enterprise. Whose form now appears upon the strand in the misty dawn? Whose voice rises above the sound of many waters breaking on the shore? It is a question. What is it? What sort of a night? What catch? Have ye any fish? No, this was not the Lord's word. Such an inquiry might seem to the disappointed men a sting of reproach for their self-devised and fruitless expedition. Such a rebuke would be well deserved, but the one who was speaking knew how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Compassion came first, chiding may follow. Children, have ye ought to eat? How the word fitted the state of the famished men. It came from him who for the past three years had kept his eye upon them to see that they lacked nothing. This voice that hailed them across the waves was the voice of him who had pitted the weary multitude on the neighboring hillside because they had nothing to eat, and would surely faint on their way home. Give ye them to eat, he had said to his apostles, and then he himself had filled the hungry with good things. The gracious one knew that men without food are men without spirit, ready to perish. What have these seven shivering men to say? The Lord asked them, Children, have ye anything to eat? Did ye forget to take bread, as once before when crossing this lake? They have to confess that now there is no food in the ship, and they answered him, No. Before displaying his mercy to them, the Lord by his gentle question made them feel the foolishness and failure of their adventure. They would then appreciate the more the refreshment he had prepared in readiness for them. There was fire and food on the shore. Eighth day. Fire for the chilled and food for the hungry. Part 2. Seven men in a boat. A night's toil. No fish. Failure admitted. A master neglected. What sort of disciples are these? Shall they not eat the bitter fruits of their own folly? Many a master would agree they, they deserve this at least. But what master is like our master? And what beloved is like our beloved? In a word, the Lord indicated the exact spot where they would now find in abundance the fish they had vainly sought throughout the watches of the night, and there the net was quickly filled. The great fishes were on the right side of the ship, about two hundred cubits from the land, near the master. Far out on the waters, where the master was not, they could not catch one. The party came ashore. When they had landed, they beheld further evidence of the Lord's thoughtfulness and loving care. They saw a fire of coals, and there was also food, a fire of coals, and fish laid thereon, and bread. The little company found themselves in the presence of the Lord of the land and the sea. He brought them into his banqueting house. He did not say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, where ye can. In the fullness of his love as of his power, he provided the fire and the food, needful to the body, and refreshing to the soul. Come to breakfast, said the Lord, who delights to serve his own, while he added, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. But he was their host. They were at the Lord's table. He took bread and gave them, and fish likewise. Which fish? Those on his fire, or those in their net? The Lord had said, Bring some of the fish which ye have now caught. The truth was they had toiled all night and had caught nothing. The fish, therefore, that they hauled ashore were his. At his word, they cast the net, in that spot, these fish were found. They could only bring to the morning banquet what he himself had given them out of the sea. This was indeed true, but, knowing it was the Lord, they did not query his word, 
but accepted the loving grace that passed over without remark their long hours of wasted toil without him, and credited them with the brief but prolific moments of their labor, when it was in and with the Lord. In communion with their risen Lord, these seven men ate of the food brought by him out of his secret storehouse, and he ate of the fruit of the labor in which he had guided their hands. He first knocked, they opened the door, he entered, they supped with him and he with them. What care the Lord has for us as men in the flesh? Our blessed Lord is no ascetic. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Once, he said to the apostles, Come ye apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. He knows our frame and its need of regular supplies of food and rest, he remembers that we are dust. Of old, he made the thousands of tired men and weary women in his audience sit down and rest themselves on the soft green grass, while he fed them with bread and fish a the produce of land and sea. In this care for others, the Lord was unchanged after his resurrection. Looking upon the seven disciples, he was touched with the feeling of their infirmities. They were cold and wet, weary and hungry. Without their aid or their asking, he provided food and warmth to revive their exhausted energies. The Lord had a care for their souls, too, but first, they ate together. They were too weak, worried, and disappointed to profit fully by his words until they were warmed and filled. But when they had dined, the Lord, as it were, took a towel and girded himself for further service. With the basin of the water of his word, he went to Peter's feet, and said, Lovest thou me? In chapter 13 it is the body, here it is the soul. Then, in the flickering firelight, Simon Peter saw himself among the brutal soldiers, and heard the voice of a servant maid, and the crowing of a cock. Love's labor had awakened reproachful memories of the apostle's threefold denial of his master, but love's ministry did not cease until his soul was restored, and Peter confessed before them all, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. There are today many dispirited souls who need the fire and food of the Lord's own ministry. Many disciples of Christ have gone into a warfare at their own charges. Some impulsive brother has said, I go a fishing. Others catch the enthusiasm and troop off with him. They forget that the first essential feature of faith is to wait for the Lord, that his unseen presence is near at hand, that he must be sought to be found, that without him they can do nothing. Nevertheless, off they go without his word of approval, though inwardly they cherish a general hope that he will bless their plans. But they cast their nets, and haul them in empty, again and again, until, even to themselves, it is clear that the enterprise is a failure. They are then sad and dispirited. They for their reviving need fire and food in the Master's presence. Think of the many derelict schemes and lost causes among Christians, launched with much fervor and outward promise, but ending in a blank of disappointment. Think of dwindling companies, of men failing to keep rank in the assembly, of lifeless worship, of formal prayers, of unseasonable and unprofitable ministry, of disunited households, of barren gospel preaching, of empty nets. O, oh, Lord, pity the shivering and starving among thy saints, and come to meet them with thy fire and thy food, as long ago thou didst come on the Galilean shore. Indeed, we do not need to pray thus to our loving Lord, the great head of his church. He never forgets even those who are cold and hungry through their thoughtless neglect of him and his word. For such especially he kindles the fire and prepares the food. His delight is to warm the affections and to strengthen the inward man. His joy is to make his own lie down in green pastures and to lead them beside the still waters that he may restore their souls by his own pastoral care. Ninth Day Casting Away the Garment And they call the blind man, saying to him, Be of good courage, rise up, he calls thee. And, throwing away his garment, he started up and came to Jesus, Mark 10 verses 49 and 50. What a vivid picture Mark draws. A blind man is seated by the dusty wayside. The distant hum of busy talk and the dull shuffle of sandaled feet fall upon the quick ears of the sightless mendicanticles he hears that Jesus the Nazarene is drawing near, 
of whom such heart-searching reports of compassionate healing were spreading everywhere. Often had Bartimaeus in his idle moments pondered upon those tales of his mighty deeds of healing power and his words of gracious speech. How beautifully, as it seemed to him, those tales fitted the ancient prophecies and promises he had heard read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. Surely, Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, the long-expected son of David. Was he not born in Bethlehem, and would he not now be on his way to Jerusalem, the city of the great king? Now the blind man learns that with this oncoming crowd Jesus of Nazareth is passing near him. Filled with the sense of his poverty and wretchedness, he calls aloud to him for mercy, mercy from the son of David, blessed mercy at the gate of Jericho, the city cursed by Joshua, mercy for blind Bartimaeus the beggar as there was for Rahab the harlot, mercy for his blindness as it had been shown to other blind men. His cries for mercy were insistent, dominating the casual chatter of the crowd by the pitiful need behind them, and their very reiteration proved the intense fervency of the appeal. They instantly drew forth the Lord's compassion. His comforting and healing word was soon addressed to the earnest pleader. But first, a regal summons to his presence was willingly passed to the eager suppliant. He who had been calling so loudly to Jesus heard the words, Rise, he calleth thee. Consider this marvel of mercy. The ark of God with its golden mercy seat, passing the walls of Jericho, is standing still, and the son of Timaeus is summoned into the presence of him who, though lowly son of man, is the Lord of all the earth. He is invited to press his suit for mercy at the very feet of David's son and David's Lord. Obediently to this message from the Lord, Bartimaeus rose up from the posture of alms seeking, and in his eagerness to obey he threw aside his covering cloak. Herein lies the lesson the blind man teaches today. It matters not whether the garment discarded was a tattered rag or a costly robe, nor whether Bartimaeus thought that a garment good enough for him when begging alms by the roadside would be unsuitable when he stood before the king. Its renunciation conveys the lesson. The truth was that the beggar was very properly in a great hurry to obey the royal mandate. The manner of his rising up showed this keenness. He sprang to his feet. This readiness to answer the master's call also caused him to abandon his long cloak. It would flap about his feet, and hinder his progress. He did not stay to gird it about his loins. He would move more quickly without it altogether. Let it go then. Throwing away his garment, he started up and came to Jesus. Sometimes, then, even the garments that seem necessary to us may hinder our promptness in obeying the commandments of the Lord. Any enveloping circumstance of convenience and comfort may in our case answer to the beggar's robe. Comfort and convenience are but relative terms, and vary widely, but may hinder equally. A moth-eaten mantle is not to be despised when one is sitting by the wayside, hoping that some passerby will throw down a farthing, or at least a mite, and all the while the shrewd winds are blowing. Other men's standards are higher. They require to be clothed in purple and fine linen and rich furs, with coal fires and well-built houses, with fruitful fields, large incomes, and wealthy friends. With what difficulty they enter the kingdom and come into the presence of the king. But, rich or poor, how often the things of this life, whether surplus or necessary, prevent a quick response, or even any response at all, to the words of the Lord Jesus. He once said to the young man who came to him in the gay clothing of rich possessions, Come, follow me. But his riches entangled his feet. All that he had was too great a sacrifice. He went away. He was not ready to throw aside his garment of respectable religion and follow Jesus in the way. The call of the Master always decides whether there is active faith in the heart or not. Those who believe in the Lord Jesus, in his kingly greatness, in his ineffable love, are the ones who with alacrity obey his call, Come, follow me. Then, boats and fish, father and home, are, like the beggar's garment, thrown aside as impediments to a wholehearted devoted discipleship. If we do not strip ourselves for the race, how can we run well in the way of his commandments? If we would closely follow the Lord Jesus, the leader as well as completer of faith, there are weights for us to lay aside, 
and also sin that so easily entangles us. Freed from such fetters we shall run and not be weary. To get to the breaking of bread, to the gospel preaching, to the prayer meeting, to the reading meeting, requires some effort, some sacrifice of selfish ease. To be regular in one's private prayer and Bible study calls for energy to jettison the pillows and cushions and rugs of comfort. Rise up, he calls thee. These and a thousand other forms of Christian activity await our fulfillment. But, in order to undertake any or all of these tasks as fully as we might, we must forego our hours of ease, of indolence, of indulgence in the world's favors and pleasures. We must throw away the garment, and spring to attention for ready obedience to the Master's word. Denial of self is essential for true devotion to Christ. To be crucified with Christ is not painless. Like Paul, we need mercy from the Lord in order to be found faithful to him. To those who, like Bartimaeus, cry to him for that mercy, the message still comes, as it came along the Jericho road, be of good courage, rise up, he calls thee. Let us then throw aside the rags of our unprofitableness and penury, and come to our Lord that we may receive the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and also his constant directions for our service as we follow him in the way we have never traveled before. Running my race in a darkening day. Hearing his voice, my guide for the way. Doffing the garment of self and sin. Striving the goal and its prize to win. Rising from ease, impelled by his grace. Quitting the pleasure that slackens my pace. Freeing my heart from each selfish aim. Yielding my will to my master's claim. Listening to Jesus his word to obey. Treading his steps in the rough pilgrim way. Serving and suffering close to his side. Praying each day with him to abide. Counting my garment but dung and dross. Scorning for him all my shame and my loss. Won by the love that a beggar could call. Praising, adoring, before him I fall. Tenth day. The supper in Bethany. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him, John 12 verse 2. The supper in Bethany is quite distinct from the Paschal Supper in Jerusalem two days later. In the latter instance, the Lord himself directed its preparation. He said to his disciples, Go into the city to such a man and say to him, The Master says, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples, Matthew 26 verse 18. But in Bethany, the supper was prepared for him by others. A few there remained faithful in their attachment to the Lord Jesus, and they made him a supper. Their entertainment of him was of a private and personal nature, unlike the Paschal Supper, which was the appointed annual observance for the nation at large. The supper in Bethany came during the final week of our Lord's service among men, a week fuller of disappointment to him than any. Daily, while teaching the people in the temple courts, his adversaries by cunning questions sought to entangle him in his talk. Hungry for fruit to his labor, he sought it in vain upon the fig tree, for it was barren. Weary with the relentless repulses of his devoted service, the Lord sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple and unfolded to his disciples the long vista of sorrows which would fall upon that doomed city before the millennial day should come when she would know and enjoy the peace and prosperity promised of God, which he had come to bestow. What an ending to the ministry of Jehovah's perfect servant. His intense love for man was rewarded by man's bitterest hatred and profoundest contempt. But the greater the sins of the nation the more arduous had been his service. Now at its close, he has to take up the prophetic words concerning that servant, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for naught, Isaiah 49 verse 4. But if the nation despised their Messiah, there are a few to honor him. If the mass turned away their faces from him, a little remnant seek to minister to his wants and to do him reverence. There is always an Abigail to own the fugitive David as the anointed of Jehovah and to supply him with food in the wilderness. And when David's royal rights are disowned in Jerusalem, Barzilla, the aged Jalidite, brings lavishly of his substance to the impoverished and exiled king. Now, in Bethany, loving hearts and loving hands were waiting to refresh, so far as they were able, 
the one whose faithful service for God has aroused the enmity of the Jews, and was drawing to its close. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until the evening, Psalm 104, And the evening of the Lord's life on earth was at hand. Even then its shadows were falling, for it was but two days before the final Passover and its fearful fulfillment. The hour of Christ's supreme anguish was about to strike. It was at this juncture that the Father put it into the hearts of these devoted disciples in Bethany to prepare refreshment for him, which they did in the house of Simon the leper. But the glory of that house was its guest. All present had eyes, not for the host, but for the guest. The Lord had the preeminence, they sat at the table with him. The order of heaven prevailed in Bethany. Custom forbade that the women should be at the table, but they had their part at the feast. Martha served. Mary brought forth her vase of precious ointment and anointed both the head and feet of her master and lord. The fragrance of this act of devoted worship was perceived by all in the house, but its true significance was known only to the lord and to herself. Mary, who once in her listening chose that good part, now in her doing wrought the best of all. Like Mary, the mother of our lord, she had kept all sayings in her heart. His word was her secret treasure, her meditation day and night, more precious to her than her precious spikenard. That word now taught her the right thing to do. Now, two days before the Passover, nothing was more vividly present to her heart than the crucifixion and death of him whom she had heard say at her brother's grave, I am the resurrection and the life. She had learned that the Lord who had raised to life Lazarus after four days bondage to death would himself lie three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and then rise again. Oppressed as Mary was with forebodings of what awaited her master, she did not wail and lament like the daughters of Jerusalem when Jesus was led to Calvary. Her faith rose above the darkness of the valley of the shadow of death and expressed itself in a more excellent way. Her ointment was not for the dead body of her Lord, but for his living head and feet. In advance, Mary brought her costly and treasured spikener to anoint that holy body, which, though it would rest in the tomb, would see no corruption. Her offering of sweet spices was her fragrant tribute to her living Lord, to Israel's anointed king, who had come to Zion, crowned with meekness and robed with humility and obedience as far even as death, and that the death of the cross. For Mary, the day of the Lord's burying had come, and her sweet spices had been prepared beforehand and were reserved for this day. Her anointing was an act of faith working by love. The Lord said of the good work she wrought that day, she has done what she could, she is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying, Mark 14 verse 8. She broke her hoarded box with yearning love, and poured the ointment over his sacred feet, and round her name in earth and heaven above. The odor of her ointment still is sweet. The Holy Spirit in the narrative gives prominence to the act of Mary. Lazarus at the table was the living witness of the glory of God in resurrection. Simon's house was full of those who knew that death had been robbed of its victory in Bethany. Those who had mourned at the tomb were now rejoicing at the table. But Mary knew more of the secret of the Lord than all the others. She was aware that he who wiped away the tears of bereavement would not exempt himself from the dominion of death. Like a subdued spiritual song to the Lord alone, Mary's perfume shed abroad her soul's conviction. The broken box let loose the imprisoned thoughts of her heart. The shattered vase was her memorial of her Lord's death. We, too, may bring the memorial of the Lord's death to his table. He is still rejected by his own people, Israel and his word to those who form his assembly is, Do this for a memorial of me. And in partaking of the loaf and the cup, we show the Lord's death till he come. But the secret of the alabaster box of ointment always is between the Lord and the individual worshipper, though the perfume itself may fill the whole house. It is an honor for us to be at his table, it is grateful to him when we break our box of precious things at his feet, pouring out before him the precious things we have gathered up and stored for the occasion. Eleventh day. Establishing our goings. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God, 
many shall see it, and fear and shall trust in the Lord, Psalm 40 verses 2 and 3. Up from the quagmire of sin to the mountain peak where no clouds dim the glories of the ascended Christ, up from the pit of shame to the rock that is higher than I, such is the uplift of grace. There in those heights of divine favor the redeemed of the Lord, though in the wilderness, can sing their new and heavenly songs, far above the din of earthly strife, in faith at the very gate of bliss itself, though not yet in fact within the courts of eternal peace and joy. Is then our new life to be a ceaseless song only? Certainly, we must ever sing, without ceasing, sing. But there are also other experiences. There are cliffs to scale, torrents to ford, deserts to cross, enemies to conquer. These are our goings. There is a new standing that we have upon the rock, but there is also a new going. It is good to be no longer struggling and slipping in the miry clay but to be resting steadfastly with the feet upon the living stone, the rock of ages. But it is not enough to be always standing, whether at ease or even at attention, in the Christian life there must be movement, progress must be made. The believer is not a statue set upon a solid pedestal, he is a traveler, a climber. There are goings behind him and before him. The word of the Lord to us, as it was to Israel of old, is go forward. The life of faith is one of steady movement onward and upward, of painful striving towards a goal, of pedestrian effort rather than easy, comfortable, speedy transport. There are no motor roads for faith, but rugged foot tracks over desolate moors and craggy mountain peaks. We need one to prepare our way before us. And we have such a one in the toilsome journey of life. Our God establishes the goings of those who place their trust and confidence in Him, the living God and Father. Our Lord is near to keep us from falling. In the Gospels, we have many a picture of the Lame made to walk come to the pool of Bethesda, and the crowd of impotent folk in its porches. Regard one hopeless case among them. Think of thirty-eight long years, prostrate in feebleness, thirty-eight years of failure to plunge first into the waters of healing and gain strength to stand upright and walk as a man should do. Then think of that same cripple sight of the man of Nazareth, a bending form, a pitying look, a whispered word. Behold him rise, stand erect, take up his bed and walk. For such a man, only to stand was a miracle of effort, to walk was a miracle of motion. The Lord established his goings, and afterwards found him in the temple. Thus the infirm man, by the word of the Lord, was brought up out of the miry pit of weakness and despair, where there was no standing for him. The Savior's power made him to stand upon the rock of salvation. That same power established his going so that he walked in the presence of the great multitude of impotent folk assembled there. It might be said of the healed cripple in Bethesda, as it was of another one also in the temple courts, all the people saw him walking and praising God, Acts 3 9. Both had been brought up out of the miry clay, and their goings were a progressive testimony to the name of the Lord Jesus. The word goings is equivalent to steps, and the phrase established my goings, in Psalm 40 verse 2, is in another translation rendered, enabled me to step firmly. Freedom, strength, and steadiness had been bestowed. Firm steps are not possible when one's feet are in the miry clay. But stability comes when the feet have been placed upon the rock. At the bidding of his master, Simon Peter was enabled to set his feet firmly even upon the liquid waves, and by his goings over the waters, he became a striking witness of the power of Christ causing a man to rise above the extreme limitations of nature. But, when Peter walked in the counsel of the ungodly, and stood in the way of sinners, and sat in the assembly of the scornful, his steps declined from the way of faithful testimony. In the high priest's palace, Peter was in the miry clay again, and his steps began to slide. If the apostle had been a prudent man and had been looking well to his goings, Proverbs 14 verse 15, he would have watched and prayed in Gethsemane and avoided the place of temptation amongst the enemies of Christ. But there Peter's feet were almost gone, his steps, goings, had well nigh slipped, Psalm 73 verse 2. Mercifully, the Lord held him up and made him safe, Psalm 119 verse 117. 
he brought him up out of the horrible pit and established his goings. But even if we are careful not to choose the slippery paths of temptation, we must not expect to escape the rough roads of difficulty and trial. Nevertheless, in the latter, he who according to this Old Testament phrase establishes our goings, says to us, in New Testament assurance, my grace is sufficient for thee. In the stony ways of discipleship to Christ, we can always count upon Asher's blessing, thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength, or, rest, be, Deuteronomy 33 verse 25. When the foundations of pure testimony seem destroyed, and it is difficult to stand against the crowd of deserters from the faith, we can sing, like Habakkuk, the Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places, Habakkuk 3 verse 19. The prophet's goings were established, though the Chaldeans overran Judah and Jerusalem. We are on the way, and our goings lead to the Father's house. Do we sometimes say, like Thomas, how can we know the way? The Lord's answer is recorded to establish our goings, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me, John 14 verse 5. As he is the way there, we must walk with him, and we shall find his yoke easy, and his burden light. Walking after him, our goings are truly established, for they become like his goings, 1 John 2 verse 6. Our progress is steady. We learn to keep rank with him and with one another. Following Christ closely in the way, we do not stumble or stray. His hand supports and guides us. The Israelites needed guidance in the wilderness, they knew not the way, and were prone to wander. Hence Jehovah took them by the hand and guided their steps, Jeremiah 31 verse 32. So when the Lord Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out, his goings were safe and sure in the hand of Jesus, Mark 8 verse 23. Do not we feel our need of the personal touch of a hand from on high? What else but the omnipotent hand of love can establish our goings, and keep us steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Blessed Lord of love! Through all my pilgrim days, hold thou my hand. In willful moods, in idle moments, too. Hold thou my hand. Thy hand upholds the heavens, the earth, the sea. In pitying grace thy hand was pierced for me. Should crowding trials shake my faith in thee. Hold thou my hand. When hellish hosts my onward way oppose. Hold thou my hand. No foe I'll fear, nor sorrows keen and deep. Since thou art near, my trembling heart to keep. When days be bright, and sunshine cheers me on. Hold thou my hand. Should warfare cease, and Satan seem to sleep. Hold thou my hand. My treacherous heart might lead me far from thee. Forgetting soon thy death, thy life, for me. Blessed Lord of grace. So patient, tender, true. Hold thou my hand. So changeful I. So apt from thee to turn. Hold fast my hand. May thy strong hand still hold me evermore. Till home at last, my pilgrim needs be o'er. Twelfth day. Tears in Bethany. Mary therefore when she came where Jesus was, having seen him, fell at his feet. Jesus therefore, when he saw her weeping, and the Jews that came with her weeping, was deeply moved in spirit, and troubled himself. Jesus wept, John 11 verses 32 to 35, William Kelly. Are tears discreditable to a Christian mourner? Is it wrong for believers to weep at the loss of loved ones? Never, if we, like Mary, weep at the feet of Jesus. Our Lord has an understanding heart. He knows the depths of our grief better than our dearest friends. Seeing our tears, He comes to us. And His very presence brings a greater relief than our tears. The pangs of the human heart are known to Him, though He is on high. This was true of old. When Hezekiah was sick to death, Jehovah's message to him was, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears and thy shuddering at the thought of the grave, 2 Kings 20 verse 5. The king's sorrow had brought the Lord and his anointed together, 
and Hezekiah's life was spared, and his sadness was turned into songs. But the divine sympathies with human grief were not fully exhibited until the Son of God himself came into this world of tears. Now we have seen in him the comforting power of divine love. Those who saw his sympathy with the mourners in the days of his flesh can say in the words of the prophet, Surely he has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, Isaiah 53 verse 4. Jacob, Joshua, Jeremiah never knew the revelation of divine sympathy made in Capernaum and Nairn and Bethany. The pious and patient Job lacked some heart to share his great sorrow, while his eye poured out his tears to God, and his face was foul with weeping, Job 16 verses 16 and 20. Job sat himself down in the ashes, silently nursing his grief for seven days and seven nights, his three friends uttering not a single word of sympathy. Heaviness of heart had sealed up his own lips also and dried up his spirit. In those sad days, the lonely and friendless Job knew nothing of the living presence of the man of sorrows, who came to the mourners in Bethany. Mary sat alone in the house at Bethany, grief-stricken, overwhelmed with sorrow because the dwelling place that had known the presiding presence of her beloved brother, Lazarus, would know him again no more for a verse she herself had lost the support and solace of her affectionate brother. But besides her sisterly grief for Lazarus, another dark shadow was upon her heart as a cloud which deepened as day after day passed and Jesus did not come. Why was her prayer for her brother unanswered? She sent a special message to the Master. Why had he not come and preserved the life of Lazarus, his friend? Again, another momentous consideration would add still to Mary's perplexity and grief. She had learned that Jesus was the sent one of God, the hope of Israel. As the long-promised Messiah, was he not about to establish his kingdom, and reign gloriously in Zion? Oh, why then should Lazarus, her brother, whom she knew that Jesus loved, verse 3, become the prey of death on the eve of that kingdom? Why should he, more than others in Judea less pious, be snatched away from the coming joys of living under the rule of the long-promised Messiah? Truly, bereavement so often brings many a dark and puzzling thought to the brooding heart, but, thank God, it also brings the Lord himself to the mourners, as he came to those in Bethany. When Mary saw the Lord, she fell down at his feet in humble prostration and welcome relief. There, where once she sat to drink in his words of truth and grace, she now utters the plaint of her soul, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. In these words, there was a little truth, for she believed the Lord had power over death itself, a little misunderstanding, for she had thought he must needs come to Bethany to preserve her brother's life, a little ignorance, too for she did not know that the death of Lazarus was for the glory of God and that a surprise for her was to come out of the tomb itself. But the Lord saw Mary's tears. Her words of mild complaint he accepted just as they were uttered, and he made no remark. Her tears, however, awakened and made manifest his inner sympathies. Her brimming eyes told him the depths of her grief far more than any words could. Even the Jewish neighbors wept also, for sobs and tears are infectious. But the marvel of marvels was yet to follow. The blessed and eternal Son of God joined himself with the weepers. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, he groaned in spirit, and was troubled. Jesus wept. How blessed the tears of Mary that drew forth the tears of Jesus! How we love that shortest and sweetest of all the sweet verses of Scripture, Jesus wept, shed tears, dot. Tears of tenderest sympathy telling of the infinite love of his tender heart burdened also with the myriad griefs of a groaning world. Though he knew that in a moment or so Mary would behold and embrace the brother she mourned, yet Jesus shed tears, tears for the mourners, and tears with the mourners, every tear telling the tale of his sympathies. Precious monument of divine sympathy raised in Bethany for the sorrowing years that should follow. Today, multitudes of sad-eyed ones are burying their dead loved ones out of their sight. For them, all in their sorrow did they but know it, Jesus wept. But more, that same Jesus, the Son of God, is still touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So that, as we believe in his unchanging love, 
we are comforted by the memory of his tears in Bethany and by the assurance of his present-day sympathies from the throne above. We remember too his promise, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you, John 14 verse 18. And when he comes into the heart, we know his sympathy and priestly love, and the desolate places of the soul are refreshed by his encircling presence. We know him, as we could not know. Through heaven's golden years. We there shall see his glorious face. But Mary saw his tears. The touch that heals the broken heart. Is never felt above. His angels know his blessedness. His wayworn saints his love. When in the glory and the rest. We joyfully adore. Remembering the desert way. We yet shall praise him more.